Our next algorithm we're going to talk about is binary search. Binary search works by taking a sorted array and trying to find a particular value within that array by looking at the middle value and then comparing the search value to that. If it's equal, you're done. If it's smaller, it's on the left. If it's bigger, it's on the right. So to show an example, if we have 1, 4, 6, 9, 10, 12, 15, and we want to search for 4, let's say we try that. What it does is it begins by looking in the middle. The middle value here is 9. It checks is 4 equal to 9. It ain't. So then it searches the left half because 4 is less than 9. It has to be to the left because the array, the array is sorted. So we'll go to the left half and search there. It checks the middle value in the left half, which is 4, and it found it. That was pretty quick. Let's say we wanted to search for 15. To do that, what it would do is we'll do this in light blue now. It starts by searching 9. And then it looks in the right half because 15 is bigger. It then searches 12. It then notices 15 is bigger than 12, so it searches 15. This looks very efficient because we're sort of eliminating half of the results every single time. This turns out to be a very, very, very effective searching algorithm if you're trying to search through a sorted array. There's a couple of problems with this code, though. So I talked all about this thing there, but there's some things here that we haven't seen before that are going to cause some issues. Before we get too much into the weeds, we need to talk about the fact that there are two divergent behaviors here. When you find the answer, it takes almost no time. And if you don't find the answer, it could take much longer. So we're going to talk about two different ideas. Best case and worst case running time. Best case and worst case. The best case runtime is however, whatever input you could give me that makes it run as quickly as possible. It's the runtime on an input of size n that is as small as possible. Or just the runtime that is the quickest. How what is the fastest your code could run? Let's move our worst case down here. The worst case is the exact same thing. I'm even going to copy paste it, but the as big as possible. So copy paste, and the only difference is that it is as big as possible. How could you make it take as long as humanly possible? Notice it, the input is still of size n. It's not going to be oh, just don't give me an array. That's not a valid best case because then every algorithm's best case would be theta of one. The best case is when you assume that you have a size n, what is the best you could hope for? If we look at the code here, one of these is easy. If we look at the code, there are three things that happen. We have an if, an else if, and an else. In one of those cases, we make no recursive call. In the other two, we make a recursive call. So clearly, the best case, which we will highlight with a light blue here, is going to be this if statement there. That is always the best case. So the best case runtime is going to be if k equals a at mid p on the first call to the function. And in that case, what happens? Well, we're going to assume that this first if statement gets met. We'll come back to that in a second. We then find the midpoint, which takes constant time. We do a comparison, which takes constant time. We find we assign this index, which takes constant time. Then we return the index. Everything there is constant time. So, which takes constant time. Which takes constant time, which we call theta one time. That was easy. We can hope the worst case is better. It's not. It's going to be a lot more heavy lifting to do the worst case. Just so we can differentiate exactly what we're doing, we are going to color the best case. I often do this in blue because for whatever reason, I assume blue is better than red. So we do blue there, but then we're going to analyze the worst case. 
We need to get into the weeds to analyze the worst case here. We're not gonna get fully into the weeds, but enough to understand what's going on. So the worst case is clearly either the else if or the else, but they involve this thing called mid P and they were gonna make us care about these variables. Notice this array, I said input of size N, N isn't even a variable in this problem. Our in algorithm here takes A, I, J, and K as inputs. So we are going to let N equal J minus I plus one. The way this algorithm works actually is it sort searches within the range I to J, including I and J, and that the number of elements in that range is N, J minus I plus one. So we're gonna define the size of the array to be this value. And if we want to try to figure out the sizes of these recursive calls, we're going to need to plug into that. So mid P looks like I plus J divided by two. So the first recursive call there looks like mid P minus one, which is I plus J over two minus one minus I plus one using our formula that we had. Some nice things happen, the plus one and minus one cancel. And then we have I over two minus I. So this will be J minus I all over two. You can chug through the algebra and write out more steps if you so desire, but this is really, really, really close to N over two. Let's do the same thing for the second recursive call. We're in that different color just to make it more easy to differentiate. So we have the top bound minus the lower thing, which is I plus J divided by two plus one. And then we have the additional plus one. Remember, it was J minus I plus one, which is the third argument minus the second argument plus one. We're going to have to do some more thinking here. Probably this is J minus I plus J over two. Then we have a minus one and a plus one that cancel. And this is also going to simplify to J minus I all over two, which is again, really, really close to N over two. I'm doing this approximation. If you wanted to, you could actually contend with the floors here and find out that the worst case is exactly N over two, it turns out. Not approximately, it is exact. Our ignoring or of the floor function here is why this occurred. So if we actually wanted to contend with the floor function and chug through all of the details, you can get that this isn't just approximately N over two, it is N over two. But the details of that are tedious and a bit too numerically fiddly to want to spend several minutes going through it. So we're just going to say it's an approximation. So it looks like the size of the recursive call in either case is really close to N over two. In fact, in practice, it is actually N over two. So in the worst case, what does the code do? Well, it makes recursive calls because that's definitely going to take more time than not making a recursive call. So T of N is equal to, well, if other than the recursive call, everything this function does takes constant time. There's no loops. There's no weird other function calls. It all takes constant time plus a recursive call of size and over two. And then we've been ignoring it the whole time, but we got to deal with the base case. Now we have T of I is less than J. Well, we can maybe rearrange that and say that that is going to be I minus J less than or equal to zero or something. Yeah, it doesn't look helpful. Maybe we try something else instead and say, well, maybe subtract the I to the other side. And that looks like J minus I greater than or equal to zero. That kind of looks pretty good because that kind of looks like N. So if I add one to both sides, I get J minus I plus one greater than or equal to one, which looks pretty good actually, because that's N greater than or equal to one. That looks pretty promising. That's N greater than or equal to one. So if n is greater than or equal to one, do this stuff. That makes perfect sense. If there are things still in the array to be searched, do the search. If not, we don't. So our base case is going to be n less than one, which the first value that satisfies that is zero. So this is t of zero equals c1. You should think about that for a second, and we're going to find out that this is not a good thing, that it is T of zero equals C1. The reason is our recursive call here is dividing by two and we've ignored floor functions. So this is not integer division, this is division. 
You can never divide by two enough times to ever get to zero. It takes infinitely many divisions. So in practice, because we've ignored the floor, we really should call this base case T of one. This is a bit of a inconvenience for ignoring the floor functions. But as I said before, the dealing with them is a bit too tedious to get into the weeds here. So we're not going to do that. So we now have our recurrence relation. We can do all of our substitutions, all the stuff we've done in the past. So let's try and do that. We need to plug n over 2 back into the, the master equation here. So we need to plug n over 2 into star. We get t of n over 2 is equal to c2 plus t of n over 2 over 2 which is t of n over 2 is equal to c2 plus t of n over 4. So then off to the side over here, we get t of n is equal to c2 plus the substitution, which is c2 plus t of n over 4. I'm actually going to collect together my like terms here and get t of n is equal to 2c2 plus t of n over 4. We then are going to do the same thing with n over 4. So, so plug n over 4 into star, which gives us t of n over 4 is equal to c2. Plus, I'm going to skip some algebra for you. We can That, that will be simplified to t of n over 8. We did this exact sort of thing in the previous video and in the previous substitution. So hopefully you can see that that's going to happen. We're just continually dividing by 2 over and over again. And then using that, we plug that then back into the equation we have above, which is t of n is equal to 2c2 plus t of n over 4, which we now have an expression for. It's just c2 plus t of n over 8. So t of n is equal to 3c2 plus t of n over 8. This pattern actually looks really nice, so we can identify that for any value of k, for any value of k greater than or equal to 1, we get t of n is equal to k times c2 because the third equation here has a 3 in front, the second equation has a 2, the first equation has a 1. Looks a heck of a lot like kc2. Plus t of, the pattern is exactly the same. This looks like n divided by 2 to the k. And now we just need to solve for k. So to solve for k, we're going to choose k such that n divided by 2 to the k is equal to 1. Remember, we chose 1 instead of 0 because of the fiddliness of the floor functions, which we have ignored. We solve this for k, and we get n equals 2 to the k. k equals log base 2 of n. And now this is an easy problem because I didn't actually have a summation here. I just had some basic expressions. So we get t of n is equal to c2 times k, which is log base 2 of n, plus t of n over 2 to the k, which I know by definition is going to be 1. And just as in all the other problems, that t of 1 simplifies, and we get t of n is equal to c2 log base 2 of n plus c1, which hopefully we can look at that and say, yep, that had, that's definitely going to be in theta of log of n. So t of n is in theta of log of n. This is a famous thing that binary search takes log of n time. It is a very, very efficient, efficient search algorithm. It is a classic one that is used to introduce recursion as well, because it's a very practical thing that you can use in real application. Notice that in this problem, we had to do this best and worst case analysis and they were different. In some problems, there could be randomness in them, things that change based on the input, but it might not affect the runtime. It might be that it just makes it look cosmetically different, not practically different. So in practice, we sometimes have to find the best and worst case. This should happen if there are if statements. There is a third one, which we did not mention here, which is called the expected case running time, which you need to delve into some probability and say how likely is a particular input. But that is an another topic entirely and involves more study.